Hello and uh, welcome to this week's edition of uh, Politics Today and in this programme we'll be discussing when end of care life goes wrong and exposing the scandals in so many of our hospitals regarding the treatment of vulnerable patients who are close to death and how they are treated at the end and uh, there's been a very uh, important and significant parliamentary report put out for parliamentarians to wake up to essentially this huge crisis that we're only just beginning to get to grips with. So in this programme today I'm joined by the Reverend Linda Rose who is the CEO of Voice for Justice uh, together also with uh, Robert Harris who has uh, who was the editor of the report when end of life care goes wrong. So Linda I'll, I'll start off with you because with your organisation for Voice of Justice you are doing um, superb work in raising awareness on so many social issues uh, in Parliament and, and I was blessed last week to be in Parliament to hear the presentation of your report uh, End of Life Care uh, when it goes wrong. So, but for our viewers, can you just share with us uh, how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and how you really started this organisation, um, the Voice for Justice? Gosh, that's going back quite a way, Simon. Um, I think I've always kind of uh, thought I was Christian. And then at university, I got involved with Transcendental Meditation. And I practiced that for about 10, 12 years. I was getting a bit cheesed off because they were bringing things in like flying, yogic flying, all this sort of stuff, which struck me being rather practical. It's a bit silly. Um, so I actually asked God to show me what, um, what, what I was doing wrong, what the truth was here. And after that, very shortly after that, our son became very ill. And uh, one of my husband's colleagues had become Christian and they had moved to uh, a village outside Cambridge where they met a couple who were involved in the Ministry of Healing. And we were invited to go and meet this couple, which we did. And I remember walking into this room and the guy got up and he looked at me and he said, are you involved in Eastern religions? And I was a bit thrown by this, I hadn't come across this ever. So I said, well, um, you probably know I am because they'll have told you that I am. And he said, no, nope, I don't know anything about you at all, but I have a word for you from the Lord. And he's telling you it's time to come into the church. And that hit me right between the eyes. And as a family, we became Christian from that moment. But I started a learning curve from that moment. I learned there are a lot of things I had to repent of. And um, yeah, a few weeks after that, I was praying and I had this weird experience where I was in a garden and I was walking along and uh, there was someone beside me, but I couldn't see them, but I knew it was the Lord. And he said to me, do you like it here? And I said, oh, wow, yes, it's fantastic. And he said to me, OK, I'm going to leave you now. And I was devastated. And I said to him, what do you mean you're going to leave me? I said, you know, I, I don't want to be. Well, he, he said to me, well, you're where you want to be. You asked me to show you you're where you want to be. Now I'm going to leave you. And I said, but I don't want to just be here. I want to be with you. And he said to me, well, are you serious about this? And I said, yes. And he said, OK, from now on, he said, up to now, I've been walking with you. This stops. From now on, you walk with me. And that was the beginning of a journey. Amazing. And can you share with us how your organisation, uh, Voice for Justice, were, was established and the kind of remit of your organisation? Because it, it, it's so important. OK. <laughs> Well, I was asked to speak at, uh, I've been doing a lot of um, pro-life work, and I was asked to speak at a conference uh, on abortion and sex trafficking. And I said yes, and at that point I was asked to organise this conference, which took me aback slightly. But uh, a group of us came together to actually organise it, and we were looked after by a very good marketing firm, who were Christian, but they were um, secular marketing, so they were involved they were doing the marketing it's time for Jaguar Land Rover, so they're very, very good. And we used to meet in their boardroom for planning. And one day, a uh, couple of weeks before the conference actually happened, the managing director said, you know, this isn't, this isn't just a one-off occasion, this is a ministry. And we looked at each other sitting around this table and said, wow, you're right. And one of the group said, voice for justice. And that's how Voice for Justice came into being. And from the beginning, we felt that we were being called to 
defend the abused, the marginalised, to speak out for those who do not have a voice themselves and to defend Christian rights in this nation. That's what we do. Amazing, amazing. And um, Robert, it's great to have you on the programme as well and uh, just show you this uh, excellent report that uh, Robert is the editor, which is the end of life care when it goes wrong. Uh, share with us, uh, Robert, how, how you came to faith uh, and also how you got involved in a lot of uh, work in Parliament. That's a long story, so I'll try to summarise it. In Thank terms of how I that. came to faith, uh, I grew up not really knowing very much about the Bible. I had assumptions about what the Bible said uh, and what Christianity was about, but most of them were wrong, actually. And it, there was a turning point when I was invited to a Bible study uh, by a stranger. He engaged in a conversation with me about Christianity, and it became a very lively, animated conversation. And eventually he said, would you like to come to a Bible study? And I said, yes. So I'm very curious to learn more. And uh, to cut a long, long story short, the, I got involved in some very deep personal conversations with this Christian man and others. And I became acutely aware of my sins, although I had previous awareness of some of them, but I became more aware in the wider perspective of how God sees our sins. And I eventually felt compelled to fall into the embrace of God rather than it just being a f sort of, it wasn't about following rules and regulations as, you know, perhaps my perceptions inform me at the time, but I, um, I felt I had to just go down that route and see where it took me. It was very unpredictable about w what lies ahead, but uh, I, 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 went, I decided, you know, this was the only route to take to follow, follow God. Amen. Uh, and also, can you share with us uh, your parliamentary work as well uh, and how you've been able to express your Christian faith in, in the political arena and in, in Parliament? Well, the group that Linda, my colleague, and I are both associated with is the Lords and Commons Family and Child Protection Group. And it was founded um, uh, uh, quite a few decades ago uh, by Jill Knight, who was a very good pro-life MP. And we've been involved in it for since about 2011, both of us. Uh, so we produce various publications on family breakdown, uh, relationships and sex education, things that concern families and young people. And we have uh, an MP who chairs our meeting. We meet a few times a year, but we are actively trying our very best to give relevant information based on research to members of parliament, both houses of parliament, so that they can be mindful of these very highly relevant issues when discussing legislation. Uh, excellent work, I really appreciate that, so thank you so much. Uh, and Linda, before we kind of tackle this huge issue and um, big scandal, but when end of life care goes wrong uh, and discussing your report, um, just can you just share with us the kind of spiritual state that you think the nation is in? Because, you know, we're, we're having issues to do with buffer zones, abortion clinics. Uh, you know, it looks like our nation has completely abandoned its Judeo-Christian heritage. Uh, you know, we representing the, the life of Christ now are considered virtually enemies of the state. Um, just, just share with us, with, with your experience and being on the front line, the fundamental attack on Christianity in this country. Well, there's been a massive rise in secularism over the last few decades. And people are very keen to say, well, secularism is completely neutral, but it's not. Secularism is actually a different belief system and it's very hostile to Christianity. And I think what we're seeing in this country at the moment is a real battle between Christianity and between this other belief system that does not like Christianity. So we're seeing it in every area of life, literally. There is this battle going on and Christianity is becoming more and more marginalized. And I think one of the problems is that as Christians, we haven't realized this was happening and we've always prided ourselves on being very tolerant and loving, which is tremendous, but we've actually opened the door for the other side to just come in. We've let the wolves in, if you like, uh, and now I think we are beginning to have to wake up because things have got to such a state where we are seeing some appalling things going on you know, in, in every area. Uh, but we're waking up when we've actually lost a lot of ground, so we are seeing a real intense battle going on in this nation to defend um, Christian values or to go the other way. And I think we really need to wake up to this, Simon, because um, what is at stake is literally it's heaven or hell. 
and we choose one or the other. And Christians have got to stand up for their faith now because the lives, the outcomes, the future for so many is in the balance for children, for elderly people, for the vulnerable. It's at stake. We have to appreciate that there is this spiritual battle that we're caught up in, but we have to fight it at every level. Absolutely. And um, uh, Robert, can you just share with us uh, your parliamentary event uh, last week when you had a number of uh, members of parliament and uh, members of the House of Lords where you produced your report, End of Life, When End of Life Care Goes Wrong. Can you share with us some of the findings um, in this report and why it was so important to gather members of parliament and also then members of the House of Lords as well to realise the full extent of this scandal that's uh, happening to our hospitals. In many, many cases where you informed us where uh, patients at the end of their lives uh, weren't given food, they weren't hydrated, given uh, water, and also some cases where people weren't at the end of their lives ended up dying. Thank you, Simon. Well, we had a very important launch, as you say, in the House of Commons the other day, and we, we saw you there. Um, we want this to have impact in Parliament, and we've come up with some remedial actions in order to, the, to improve the system. So we're not just complaining and saying to Parliament, this is going wrong. We, we are providing solutions, so we are urging parliamentarians to take note and act upon our recommendations. As far as the kinds of issues that typically come up in these cases, uh, let me share with you what, what is very typical in these cases. So f firstly, hydration and nutrition. You have patients who may or may not be at the end of their life. Let's not assume they're always at the end of their life. They may be, but it's not a done deal. They are denied often nutrition and hydration. Now, someone can go for so long without fluids. And people may be asking, well, do they... Should they be given fluids? Because medical advice sometimes in indicates that the person can't swallow. But there are other means available clinical, clinically to actually get fluids into the body. So there is, there's really no excuse for the person to be dehydrated. Um, then there's issues of consent. So the starting principle is that the patient must give their consent to treatment. In the event that the person is unable to give their consent because they may be incapacitated in one form or another, close family relations need to be consulted. This is all in the guidelines. I mean, it's common sense, but it's all in the guidelines that those nearest to that patient must be consulted. And so often that is not happening. There's also issues of DNR orders, do not resuscitate. So um, I'll just give you one example for now. There was a lady who was a nurse. Her parents at very different times found themselves in hospital and the hospital uh, personnel asked the lady, would you like your mother, would you like your father to be on a DNR notice? She said no. The reason being is that once she had agreed to that, from her own nursing experience, she knew that that would be translated as, in the event of further things going wrong down the line, you shouldn't feed the patient. Although that's not really what it should lead to, but she, she notified them about this and they said, well, there's there's no issue, but when it later transpired that that's what they were going to do, she quickly stepped in and said, no, I want my father fed, I want my mother fed, even though the DNR notice says do not resuscitate. She was aware of what goes on, but we're, see we're, we're seeing a lot of these situations where people are not being fed, not being hydrated. There's also this thing called best interest meetings. People within the hospital, the personnel, need to get together at regular moments to review the progress of the patient, and to give uh, judgments on how the, the uh, healthcare progresses. They're not often doing that, and people are just left to die. The guidelines are very clear, there's protocols to follow, and there's human beings here. You know, forget the rules a minute, we're dealing with human beings. Uh, where is the compassion in all of this? It's not just about rules, but from a legal, ethical perspective, they need to actually follow these guidelines. And the cases that we are showing in our report shows a gross violation of the protocols and there's a, there's a callousness in so many of these cases. People are not being treated with dignity, the dignity that they deserve. The youngest case was only 21 years of age, a lady of only 21 who went into a hospital with, um, a, she wanted a minor eye operation. She had learning disabilities, which was a slightly complicating factor in that someone with learning disabilities struggles to communicate fully their wishes to other people. But put that aside for a moment, 
She died three and a half weeks later of malnutrition. Now, that's not my opinion. That's not the opinion of the medical expert who wrote the report. That's the coroner's opinion. She died of malnutrition. She only went into a hospital for a, a minor eye operation. What's going wrong? And, and Linda, just to just expose to us, really, the, the true scandal that's, that's going on and the magnitude of this malpractice that we're seeing, um, as, uh, as, as Robert uh, described very well. Oh, I think it's actually, it's massive. We don't know exact numbers, but um, we at uh, Voice for Justice, we became aware a while ago that people were complaining that this was happening. So I actually put out an appeal for people to contact us if they had experience of this. And um, we had enough responses to make us think, yes, this is a problem, which is when we started to think, OK, we'll get the laws and commons to do this, because it, it needs to be heard in Parliament. It's not enough just to do a little report. It needs this active response. Um, and, oh, we, um, we became aware that um, there were, this was affecting a lot of people. And we, we know at the moment of at least 800 complaints, but literally there are thousands upon thousands of people that this has happened to. And I, I guarantee that if you start to talk about this amongst a group of friends, at some point, someone in that group will say, you know what, that happened to me. And this problem really is that widespread. And there are so many people who have been silenced because they've been intimidated by the treatment that was given to their loved ones. And you know everybody thinks the doctors know best, so they don't really want to make a fuss. And then in retrospect, or at the time, they realize that something awful is going on. So I can't give you exact numbers, but I can say, that there are thousands of people in this nation who are affected and it's happening too often to too many and it needs addressing. And you're addressing it, which is so important, and, and this is why this, uh, we're doing a programme on it today. Um, can, uh, uh, Robbie, can you share with us why so many hospitals, hospices, care homes uh, for patients are receiving end-of-life uh, care but ignoring the recommendation and the guidelines um, put out, I think, by the uh, National Institute for Health Care and Excellent, which is, which is nice. So this is something that I'm learning about as well. This is something that I don't tend to cover on this program so I'm, I'm learning all the time as well but but to realize that this is really an issue of morality and uh, an issue of dignity uh, and that people at the end of their lives or coming to hospital should get the best treatment possible and should be looked after and uh, rather than left to die horribly in so many of these horrific cases that we're uncovering that's a great question I think there are several levels of you know there are several ways of answering that question so the everyday understanding is to say, well, the hospitals are stretched to their limits. There's, you know, uh, poor staff training, which certainly was something cited by the Neuberger Review Panel, which actually decided that the Liverpool Care Pathway, the system that was in place, should be abolished and that the new system that we're currently under would be an improvement. Um, so we can look at resources and issues like that, but I think ultimately there's a deeper issue here. There's a, there's a spiritual issue, although we don't cite that in the report because it's... It's, it, that wouldn't be something we'd bring up with parliamentarians in a publication. But really, I think there's a deeply spiritual issue and there is a, there is a culture of death in our society. We see it with abortion, we see it with so many other things, and I think this is almost certainly a, a manifestation of that culture where the vulnerable, be it at the beginning of life or at the end of life, are dismissed and written off. But from the point of view of the practical, political, legal aspects, I think people need to be held to account and this publication and the remedial actions that we propose within it to parliamentarians is an attempt to ask Parliament to look at this very closely and to improve the system so that people who are facing these situations in hospitals and their families do not have to go through the terrible distress that some of the families featured in our report have gone through. And in this report, uh, you mentioned, Linda, there are 800 complaints from families of loved ones who have revealed the kind of shocking and inhumane treatment um, that their parents, their, their mother, their, uh, 
you know, their, their brothers, sisters, their, their fathers received, um, and not given that proper care, particularly towards the, the end of life. Um, how, uh, and many of this is also compiled by guilt as well, isn't it? The, the fact that they trusted the, the care homes, that they've trusted hospitals um, to look after their parents in, in the best way that they can and, and realise that they've been let down by the system. Um, how do we rectify that? How do we rectify the, the, the problem, horrible you mean? situation, the problem? Absolutely. Um, well, um, we have put forward some remedial actions here. Uh, so, gosh, there's so many different levels. It would be, it would be very helpful for there to be a register of um, all um, hospitals, health providers in the country showing exactly what care plan that they are adhering to so that they can then be kept up to, uh, to account for the treatment that is being given. Uh, we also uh, are recommending that there is a helpline because one of the things that came out so clearly is that people in this situation, they honestly don't know what to do. And you mentioned guilt just there, Simon, and actually if your loved one dies in this way, it leaves terrible guilt for those who are left because they always ask will think, well, I should have done more. Uh, so it really, it, it, it has a terrible effect when this happens. So we are looking to set up a helpline that people can ring if they find, think they're in this situation to just say, what can I do? And is this the right treatment that my loved one's receiving? Um, so. I think one of the first lines of meeting this is a helpline which will give them medical advice, which will give them legal advice if they need to, to just help them to defend the, their loved one in this situation. Um, gosh, what else can there be? Obviously, the, the guidelines need to be um, clearer. All doctors need to be given proper training in how to apply these guidelines. And it's not, a, you know, doctors initially, they're, obviously they want to care for people. So a lot of them actually don't really want to know about end of life care because they want to get people better. But actually all doctors need to be taught because we're all going to face death sometime. It's not, you know, it's not that unusual. And doctors need to know how to give best care that it's driven by compassion and hopefully is actually put in place in collaboration with the patient you know what do you want to happen in your last days let's work to that and if the patient can't tell them that then with their loved ones what do you think you know dad or whatever would like it needs to be collaborative and we must get rid of this culture that sees somehow doctors have the right to pronounce life or death which they don't Nobody does, that, that belongs to God. And we have to learn as a society how to be more genuinely caring and compassionate. So the helpline to help people advocate, proper oversight, and it would be lovely to have a, a register and something like a kite mark, these hospitals have given this kind of treatment so that people know what to expect and how to um, ensure proper treatment basically. No, absolutely. So we're less than uh, five minutes of the programme. And uh, Robert, how can uh, our viewers get hold of this report? Because I'm absolutely convinced that there are so many of our viewers watching that this topic today is so relevant and they've experienced this either, you know, with their loved ones, with their, with their parents going into end of life care or situations regarding hospital. And of course, we don't really know what happened during lockdown, uh, um, those uh, two years of lockdown, which, which I can imagine would make things even worse. So how can they get hold of a copy of the report uh, and how can they also feed back to, to you um, exactly what's happened in their scenario so that more people's voices are heard regarding this so that they can have a political voice and obviously then the more people are aware of what's going on uh, can speak up at which forces our members of parliament into action to bring about righteous legislation. Thank you Simon. Yes I'd like to address your viewers and uh, so this is the report when end of life care goes wrong if you'd like to purchase a copy, you can go to our website. Voice for Justice UK is the publisher. Um, we're a Christian organisation and the website is vfjuk.org. That's vfjuk.org. And right on the homepage, you will see a link to the report, a summary of the report and 
uh, instructions about how to buy it. And if you feel that you are one of these people who perhaps your family member went through this or is going through this now, there is a support group online. Uh, a lady called Denise Charlesworth-Smith who helped us produce this report. Her own father died under the Liverpool Care Pathway. She's a national campaigner. She's got her own Facebook page. Um, failed by the NHS, euthanasia in hospitals. Denise Charlesworth-Smith is the lady. Uh, so feel free to make contact with her through her support group. Wonderful. Really appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Robert. And, and Linda, how vital is it that, that our viewers and everyone else really wakes up to the serious of this, seriousness of this situation, to know that it's imperative in, in a, a loving society, in a loving nation and the great heritage that we've got, that we look after people um, that, are, that are dying and coming to the end of life, that they're shown dignity and care and the respect that they deserve and, and how that really is a, should be a reflection of, of our values values as a nation and also as a people. Well, I think you're saying it yourself there, Simon, because hum um, any society is defined by the care it gives to the most vulnerable. And there is no one more vulnerable than those at the end of life. So if as a society we are actually giving the message that you are only important while you have an active role to play, that is saying something very profound about our humanity. It's actually, it's rejection of God because God calls us to love and care for everyone as made in his image. And it's opening the door to authoritarianism, to tyranny, to, to all the things that actually are against life, against democracy, if you want to put it in the, you know, social terms. It is that important. This is why we have to care for our most vulnerable, for each other because this is saying something about our society. So I would say to people, what sort of society do you want to live in? Do you value our values? Because our society is founded on Christian values. That's what's at stake. And that's why people need to support this. Absolutely. So, Linda uh, and Robert, thank you so much for being my guests uh, for this week's edition of Politics. They've done a great, a great job and thank you so much for this uh, report. And I want to thank you for watching this programme at home. I, I think we realise that what's at stake here is not only dignity, but what is really at stake is, is the well-being of those who are vulnerable, that are, that are coming to the end of their lives, that they should be treated with dignity, that they should be given fluids, uh, they should be uh, given nutrition and they should be given a kind of decent death and, and this is an imperative that this scandal is exposed and that our parliamentarians are fully aware of it so thank you for watching this week's edition of politics today <laughs>